turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Today I'm joined by Victor Meyer Schoenberger. Victor, how are you today? I'm doing great, Mark. Uh, thank you for pronouncing my name so expertly. Woo, I've been training. So, Victor, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? I spend my time uh, on planet Earth trying to figure out what life is. And that's hard. And I have I have no hope of um, answering that or solving my riddle before I die. But it was absolutely worth it. That's an awesome answer. And you know, life, life isn't about the answers, it's about the better questions. Victor, you're a really interesting guy. Uh, you're a professor of internet governance and regulation at Oxford University. This is a topic that I think it needs to be talked a lot more about. And you know, Victor, you're a New York Times bestselling author. You've written several books, Reinventing Capitalism in the Age of Big Data. That's a really nice title. Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think, and delete the virtue of forgetting in the digital age. And Victor, I think your books bring a perspective that not a lot of us are, are, are foreseeing in the future. And that perspective is really going to change the way that, that we all live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I, uh, I had a... Uh... A really a nice mentor, um, uh, elder gentleman, um, when I was at Harvard, and he said to me, you know, um, go out and tackle the really hard questions. There is um, there is enough people who are going for the easy questions. Go for the hard ones. You'll fail, but that's part of part of the process. And, and as we fail, as we try uh, through every iteration. Uh, we learn something. Um, we are not necessarily getting closer to the answer, although that's the hope, uh, but we learn something, learn something about us or learn something about the question that we are trying to answer. And so th this was uh, excellent advice. It was not very good advice for um, for career trajectories, particularly when you're a young researcher, a budding academic, because there you need to churn out your papers that sort of um, incrementally move the needle, um, uh, but uh, but it has helped me do some fun things. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's definitely an interesting time. So, you know, like, so, you know, as a human race, you know, if we take a step back and we look at the the internet and it's a uh, creation and it's, you know, how, you know, how, how early consumers got into it. And I think now we're just really seeing you know, consumerized internet at scale. And it, it, it's been extremely interesting. It's shaken up the world. It's shaken the way that we live, work, think about everything, you know, which, which ideas that we're thinking of in certain locations, who's benefiting from those ideas. And it's really taking the, the world by storm. Fast forward to today, 2018, Everything is being tracked online. You know, every single thing that we do is, is being tracked. And some people might look at, you know, these certain trivial tracking data apps on their phone. But, you know, really, it's part of a bigger thing. I think it's about we're getting the long tail of humanity. And I think we're going to be, you know, kind of revealed to ourselves in a way. And this data is going to be used to be fed back into us to whether that's to improve, to optimize for companies, to sell us things more seamlessly. And ultimately, you know, you're, I, I think you're focusing in a lot about this. And I don't even think people know what big data is. I, I think that, you know, the, the concept of it might be known in some ways. But Victor, could you give our audience here just like a very basic, you know, understanding of, of, of what big data is and, and how it relates to them? 
Oh, sure. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of talk and always has been a lot of talk about big data over the last five years. Uh, but few have a actually looked at data. You know, big data um, uh, is, is perceived by many as just having more data and doing the analysis. Um, to me, big data is um, a new perspective on the world, a new look at how things are, at reality that uh, surrounds us. And as we begin to understand reality, including ourselves better, we can make better decisions. We can self-improve if you want, but we can basically make better decisions about ourselves, about um, our family, about our friends, about society more generally. Uh, and in, in that sense, um, Big data is a continuation of a quest uh, of humanity uh, that that began hundreds of years ago uh, in earnest when we when we started in the age of um, of reason and enlightenment to try and make sense of the world to try and understand it not as a place of uh, full of magic and spirits and um, full of things we we would never be able to explain, but a place that can and ought to be explored and ought to be understood. Um, of course, there is, we are just at the, at the tip of the iceberg. We have just covered a few percentage points at best of what is there to know. Um, there is so much more that we can discover, but with data, we have a very powerful tool uh, out there. And the point about big data is not that we use the data to answer questions we already have, but the point is that we use the data and the analysis of the data to drive new questions that we didn't even think we should ask, but that we now, thanks to the data analysis, uh, find out that we really ought to answer. That was beautifully well said. And as you said, I think this is just the beginning of something we don't really know, but uh, I think it's going to be significant. And I think how we play out these years is going to be pivotal towards um, the rest of humanity's uh, function, so to speak. Um, you know, what? I, I think I think what this looks like in a, um, in a common text is, you know, 15 years from now or 10 years from now, you know, you have... Uh, Amazon, Amazon smart fridge and the, the Amazon smart fridge knows what you drink, what you eat in a time by time basis. And it can, you know, analyze what best it thinks you can do. So, you know, it can reorder your, your beer every Tuesday because it understands that, you know, when you, when you buy a six pack, you know, you drink one every day because that's your usual at, at 6 p.m. And then it'll automatically order it for you without you even, you know, asking it to. And then that poses the next question of buying and 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 selling. And, you know, it, it, like which, which is going to completely change, right? Because if Amazon or the smart thing or the assistant or whatever it is, is doing the ordering for you, it's probably not asking you if you want Budweiser, Bud Light, you know, Heineken's. It's going to order, you know, from a brand, from a corporation without even in asking you. What, what, you know, like, does that sound like a, like a predictable, you know, future? Uh, yeah, I, I think when we look at the market, um, the, the, that's a really good starting point. The, the market to a lot of people is something about commerce, something about uh, money and transactions. To me, when I look at the market, I, I see a social innovation. I see a mechanism through which we humans can coordinate with each other uh, at a level of complexity and comprehensiveness that no other species on earth can do, at least so far as we know. Um, so through the market, we, we humans coordinate. But this, this coordination through the market works through decentral decision making. The market is beautiful because every part of the market, every market participant for herself makes decisions. Um, and so if somebody makes the wrong decision, then the market doesn't falter. Uh, only the, the, the person that made the wrong decision may, mm -hmm. may feel 
uh, and be hurt, but not the market itself. So it's really resilient. It gives our society a resilience that we otherwise wouldn't have. But the, the foundation of that resilience is decentralized uh, decision making. And that requires a lot of information to be available to every participant in the market uh, so that that information can then be used to find the perfect match um, and, and based on one's preferences. Uh, and we have been really bad at human beings doing that. That is uh, conveying all of that information and then translating that information into optimal decisions. And that's where the machines and the technology come in. Uh, when we think about um, large online platforms who are really good in matching people, um, not just uh, platforms for love, but also commerce platforms or communication platforms, um, when we think about those platforms, what they really do so well compared to their offline counterparts is that they bring people together and help them coordinate. Um, and so uh, in a way, that's that's what I think uh, gives not just the market, but gives humanity um, a huge opportunity to improve itself, to become better, to, to optimize, um, uh, not towards a, um, a goal set by some leader, but a goal that emerges out of the participants of this social mechanism, out of the individuals, the people uh, partaking in that social mechanism. So I, I am, I have really high hopes if we can realize these these data rich markets. But we need to be careful so as to create them um, in a way that they don't empower a single party that then can mm -hmm. kind of mm, play tricks with us and diminish the value that we as individuals and as humanity get out of those markets. Wow, that was beautifully well said. And I was uh, I was talking to this other podcaster. His name is Kent Bai. He hosts two podcasts, Voices of VR, Virtual Reality, and Voices of AI, Artificial Intelligence. And he was telling me that the future of technology is basically centralization versus decentralization and you know i don't think i don't know if it's necessarily just about that but i think you know we're we're seeing a shift where humans have have grown up with technology and we've created these centralized systems i think maybe for the best intention of us all but usually what ends up happening is a particular party an individual gets the the upper hand and it, it kind of turns the system on itself and it's not benefiting anybody. Um, you know, and I think, I think there's that quote, it's uh, you know, a system that is dependent inherently on a perfect human is an inherently broken system because that doesn't happen. And I think it, just like you said, you know, different technologies, whether that's artificial intelligence or uh, blockchain will, will lead us into this future where, the way that we used to think about systems and the way they impact our lives has been heavily, heavily, um, you know, changed. And, and you know, you can take a, a modern look at example. I don't know if this is a good example, but maybe Uber, where you have an app on your phone and, you know, you don't have to call necessarily like this, th this taxi station or anything like that. You can just press the button on the application and it sends you uh, an individual driver. I think the Uber example is interesting. There is an even uh, in that same um, sector of the economy, an even better example called Blah Blah Car. Um, mm. uh, it's a, a ride sharing company. You can basically share a ride with somebody who is going that route anyway. Now, um, th this platform is very successful, millions and millions of rides being coordinated every month, uh, usually um, longer distance rides um, and in, in contrast to Uber. Uh, but what is interesting is that when you try to find somebody to ride with, uh, the, the, the price that you select, uh, you can uh, or you choose um, to offer or you want to have paid, um, you can select only within limited um, boundaries. Uh, but what you are asked 
to provide is information about, for example, your music taste uh, or how talkative you are. Why? Because they will try to match you with a person that has similar tastes or that has um, a, a similar preference for how talkative the the co-rider should be uh, mm. in the vehicle and and to me what this is driving is better matches matches between market participants so that we can better coordinate and um, it's not about price anymore it's not about trying to get the best it that is the cheapest deal it's about trying to find the best that is the most optimal match almost irrespective of the actual price because a really really good match is so advantageous to both sides um, that that the price becomes then almost secondary um, and uh, or, or far less important than it is when you only or mostly compare price so what we see is really a way by which we can enhance the social institutions as we move beyond just comparing apples with apples that is just comparing um, what is easy to compare uh, and uh, in the future with data rich markets we will be able to compare much more and to find um, th these these better matches and that will then enable us to achieve not just efficiency gains but also to be more sustainable uh, if we if we get stuff uh, buy stuff that we really like, we'll be more careful with it. We'll utilize it more um, uh, rather than stuff that we don't really like, uh, shoes that don't fit. We don't like to wear them. Uh, and therefore, uh, buying them is actually um, uh, not a particularly sustainable um, behavior uh, because we won't utilize this resource. Uh, and so finding better matches is not just about efficiency gains. It's about sustainability. It's about really improving uh, society uh, on a whole. Mm. Wow. Technological serendipity. Um, you know, there's there's this guy, his name is Brian Johnson. He's a real brilliant individual. And something that he states is, you know, the problems that are here and the problems that are coming up for humanity, we can't solve it by ourselves. We're going to need to look to these these networks, artificial intelligence, different things to kind of assist us in getting out of our getting out of the main issues that kind of pose us uh, as a species into the planet itself. Victor, how do you think that governments you know, across the world will will adapt to, to to these changes. You know, my experience with um, policymakers has been that they are not ahead of the curve when we when we think about technology, but behind the curve when we think about technology. Um, and that kind of, that worries me greatly. It worries me because mm -hmm. now is the time as we are, as we are entering that data age, uh, now is the time to really set the boundary conditions, to, to, to put out the framework uh, of uh, of of rules in, in in which we then will organize our society. Um, the old rules, the rules of the industrial age of the 20th century just don't work very well for this new age anymore. And so uh, we need something new. but for, for for that new, we need some policymakers that are willing to engage uh, in a dialogue about what these new, boundary conditions could be uh, if they if they talk about um old style um regulation of antitrust and competition uh, of the 20th century that won't protect us from the kind of power concentration that we might see if we don't get the the data rich markets uh, established the right way um if we get them established the right way they will empower us as i said before but if we if we don't get them right if we end up with a platform that not only um is the dominating platform 
through which we transact with each other, but is also the dominating communication source and as the dominating decision assistant uh, that we employ in our decisions, then we have one entity, one very, very powerful entity that is able to shape the behavior of all of society or all of the market. And then, of course, that fundamental quality of the market that kind of makes the market so successful, namely decentralization of decision-making goes away. And, yeah. and resilience goes away. And we are exposed to a fundamental systemic vulnerability that can bring down the entire society. So therefore, we now need to set the boundary conditions and say, what do we need to do in order to ensure that not all of the power in these data-rich markets is held by one entity. Um, and I don't see a lot of policymakers asking these type of questions in the right way. They focus on um, antitrust behavior when I want to focus on um, decision assistance, artificial intelligence, and data access. Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's such a good point. So do you think it's realistic to to kind of see a future where what we view now as as governments and the systems that kind of run these executive fun functions in society to be offloaded into these you know intelligent artificially intelligent you know blockchain based algorithms that can take care of those decisions and and help the citizens uh, of the world in a way that removes the bad things that we see in centralized government today? To an extent, yes. Um, but, but that begs the question. And the question, of course, is who is deciding on the meta level? Um, mm. if, if I delegate decisions to intelligence assistance, who is making the delegation decision? That is, who is deciding who is deciding? Mm. Um, and, and, and are we going to give up that decision-making power as well? Are we delegating the delegation power uh, as well as the decision power? If we do that, then we need to ask ourselves, um, are we still providing sufficient value? Are we bringing enough to the table of evolution as humans? Um, or are have we made ourselves redundant um, by, by that choice? Um, in other words, um, we need to begin to ask ourselves, what is it that is our contribution to uh, our contribution as humanity uh, to the future of the world, to the future of the world that we live in? Um, do we have something to offer? Um, and uh, it's probably not stupid centralized decision-making, but maybe it's some outside boundary setting. It's maybe some modeling. It's maybe some creativity and radical thinking that sometimes machines still have a hard time doing. Uh, but it's the kind of conversation that we need to have, the conversation of, of the future, the, the conversation about how to shape the future, is very different from the conversation about um, whether or not we should build a national highway system uh, or that you know we faced in the 20th century. Um, this isn't about a this isn't about a physical infrastructure. This is about a spiritual infrastructure or an intellectual infrastructure, and the question of who are the nods in this intellectual infrastructure and what's the role of humans in this? Wow, that's that's excellent. And it's going to be definitely interesting to see where this plays out and who it affects. I mean, I think it'll affect everyone and the speed at, at, at which it will kind of accelerate. And, you know, like the way that I think about um, artificial intelligence, not to steer away from the conversation or anything, but I think it's like in the same way that you look at, you know, an, an ant colony and they're all just running up and they're gra grabbing all these parts and each one of them has this role and they're building this big thing. 
I think that in a way, humanity is kind of doing that too. And I think with the emergence of the internet and different mobile computing technologies, we're kind of just like everything is happening so fast in the grand scale of things. We like we don't even know what we're making really. And I think it's kind of building up into this super intelligence. And like you said, this is a it's a spiritual question. It's an intelligence question. And, I, you know, I think this might single handedly be one of the most curious and, uh, and and mysterious questions that that we can answer without a doubt. Victor, you know, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, we didn't talk about this beforehand, so you don't have to answer this question and I can edit this out if uh, if you don't end up answering it. What do you make of all the things on the news right now with different technology companies like Facebook and Google collecting these big vats of data? And, uh, you know, the government, at least in the U.S., is kind of saying... It's kind of trying to figure it all out, and I don't know if you've listened to the the the, the Senate hearing that that it was in. the The senators and the people that are supposed to be in charge of this country, exactly like you said, are heavily far behind. Like I think one of them asked him, "How do you make money if if the users come on for free?" And it, it kind of looked like Mark Zuckerberg was just having a a a, a field you know, a, a play with all these different centers because they clearly have no idea what they're talking about. And I don't really, I don't think anybody on that Senate board really has any idea what Facebook is is, is really doing in the first place. I, I was taken aback by that comment as well. Um, I was also, though, taken aback by Jaron Lanier's comment uh, yesterday, uh, commenting on the Senate hearings when he said the, the only um, way out for Facebook or the only solution for Facebook is for Facebook to charge a monthly fee, a subscription fee, um, because the problem with Facebook uh, is really uh, the, the the poisonous revenue model that they have. Um, I think he was about as bad in understanding what's going on as the senators in the Senate hearing. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what we what we have here isn't uh, the business model that's bad or not bad. What we have here is an entity that uh, runs a marketplace of ideas, uh, that runs the, com the monopolistic communications conduit on that marketplace of ideas, the social networking platform, and that also runs the filtering mechanism that is basically the decision assistance and uh, chooses uh, what we see and what we don't see and in what order. Um, that to me is a combination of information power uh, that is highly problematic and that uh, undermines the the decentral the decentral nature uh, of both the market and democracy um, if if I were to tell you look you can you know try and sell something on a market but rather than talking directly to a potential buyer you have to go to a central intermediary and tell him, uh, for how much you are going to sell, uh, then the central intermediary chooses uh, based on some rules that you don't know what to pass on, what information to pass on to potential buyers or not. Uh, you would look at this and say, this is really bad central planning. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that can't work. Well, that's Facebook. Uh, and so my, my point about the Senate hearings is, um, Facebook needs to change, but the senators have not shown that they understand what the root of the problem is. And therefore, whatever solution they come up with will not be tightly fit to the problem at hand and therefore will most likely not do what we expected to do. And that worries me greatly. That was very well said. And to me, I kind of got it when one of the senators was asking Mark about the different political affiliations of, um, you know, certain campaigns that have that have run. And then in really in that moment, 
I just kind of understood uh, of what really went on, of how like this company grew so ridiculously fast by really creating a, a set a model of the world, putting it online, and that model is so relevant to how the real world is then acted out. It, it's really the it, it it's the plumbings. It's it. it it's the underground of of the world and it's how word of mouth is really fueled and i think it's going to be interesting to see um how these big centralized networks play out um in 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 the future for sure victor final question so i'm going to hand you the the keys to the world and if you could accomplish anything um by your by your own volition in, in in the next 10 years and you were guaranteed that this would happen what would you want to see in the world i would want to see a change in our educational system so that we mm -hmm. educate the next generation in a way that they are not faster calculators uh, or, mm. but they are more creative human beings that they see that what they bring to the table what what they can achieve is is rooted in creativity and originality and to an extent sometimes human irrationality that the machines can't simulate very well at least so far we need to shift our educational system to emphasize the human qualities of us rather than to try to make us better machines wow that was beautifully well said and just a quick note on that you know there are millions if not billions of kids um around the world today that are spending most of their six hours memorizing information when in less than a foot away from them they have this device that can access all of humanity's information almost in less than a second and uh it's it's much more exponential and scalable victor thank you so much for coming on the show where can our audience find you and uh your work uh they can find me on the web on vmsweb.net and they can find my new book reinventing capitalism in the age of big data on amazon that is awesome. All those things will be down below in the show notes for those of you who want to check it out. Victor, final, final thing, I promise. I, I asked my guests to leave the audience with a, a question because I think questions are very powerful for, for learning about yourself and maybe a, uh, a self-inquisitive question that they can kind of ask themselves throughout the day. And uh, I'd appreciate if you left my audience with one. My question is, if you could choose one thing that you could forget, what mm. would that thing be? And what would you make of the process of choosing that one thing? Reflect on that process. Wow. That was a really good question. I'm going to do that now. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback, whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.